Hello. In this lesson 6C, I will discuss the economic cost of the Kyoto Protocol and now from a, a bit more empirical perspective. So in the previous lesson, we considered uh, uh, CGE and uh, integrated uh, investment models, which, uh, which um, suggested that, uh, that uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, that was signed in 1995 uh, seem to be very, very costly and in particular highly cost inefficient. And uh, as a result of this kind of evidence, there was of course a lot of political debate that, uh, that, uh, that uh, in, in, in several countries. A notable example is the USA, which originally signed the Kyoto Protocol, but, uh, but actually never ratified it and therefore also not implemented also. Uh, there were countries such as Canada, which uh, signed and ratified, but later withdrew, perhaps following the example of the USA. And then, for example, Australia, for hesitating for a very long time, but eventually, eventually joined the agreement. So this illustrates also that, uh, that of course, this kind of uh, results of, uh, of economy-wide modeling can influence uh, uh, high-level political uh, decision making. Uh, so now, the Kyoto Protocol then was was uh, implementation started in two thousand eight, and then uh, then uh, by by twenty twenty it was already uh, implemented. But there was not any follow up in the sense that uh, there would be this kind of binding targets like in in the Kyoto Protocol. So uh, there was later, for example, the Paris Agreement, uh, which and, and, and of course this kind of yearly uh, or, or regular climate conferences still take place. But uh, unlike in the Kyoto Protocol, there are no, no binding targets for the, for the countries. So therefore, we felt with my, my two doctoral students uh, or former doctoral students, Shun Shao and Sheng Dai, that it was high time to make an empirical assessment of the economic cost of the of the Kyoto Protocol, which somehow seemed to have gone, gone uh, unnoticed in the literature so far. So I'll present some results from our article that was published in, in the World Development Journal. So as a reminder, let me go first some kind of uh, what kind of price uh, or what kind of estimates for the marginal abatement costs these uh, these uh, uh, economy-wide modeling uh, in the in the late '90s, early 2000s was was suggesting, and especially this kind of no trading scenario is uh, is uh, relevant because although there is uh, there is a trading mechanism like this uh, uh, this European emission trading, there is no global trading or or, or trading between the annex one countries at least not at the extent that. Uh, that this kind of modeling exercises would would require. So here in this table, uh, this is this reports for for at the country level our empirical estimates of the of the marginal abatement cost of of greenhouse gas abatement. So these are average for the years nineteen ninety to two thousand fifteen, and there are mentioned in euros of twenty ten per per ton of uh, ton of CO two. So I don't go through every every country specifically, but uh, but as as the broad lines, uh, we have uh, relatively similar marginal abatement cost levels in the in the in the old EU fifteen countries as as in uh, in uh, North American or Anglo American world is non European OECD countries. Then we have the uh, Eastern Europe. The so-called EU transition economies, which were which were which were earlier during the Cold War part of the part of the Eastern Bloc, so there is uh, there is much lower uh, abatement cost because in in the sense there would be much much uh, uh, easier targets to 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 abate greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at these numbers, of course there is there is quite large variation from country to country, but uh, but the magnitude of these figures seems to seems to align quite well with the 
with the predictions in the late 90s based on this kind of economy-wide model. So, so in that sense, in terms of the marginal abatement costs, these, uh, these uh, figures were not that far off. However, we need to take into account also the inflation. So these are in US dollars of the year 1990, whereas our figures are in, in euros of year 2010. So perhaps it would be something like, uh, like um, 60 to 70 percent of the of the predicted uh, marginal abatement cost. So our cost estimates are to some extent lower or, or notably lower because if we take into account uh, if we take into account inflation that occurred during 20 years. But besides the marginal abatement cost, it's of course interesting to see what was then the 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 abatement cost in euros. So having estimated these marginal abatement costs, then we can use the in definite integral and integral calculus to, to calculate what was then, then the cost. And we can we can proportion that what is the cost per, per person in, in different countries. So of course, marginal abatement cost, we can think of it as, a, as the partial derivative of the, of the abatement cost. So therefore by integrating, we can get this kind of uh, a total abatement cost. And uh, this table reports from this, again, based on this World Development article by, by myself and, uh, and uh, show and die, what would be the, the average abatement cost per capita per year, again, in, in euros of uh, 2010. And uh, here we see quite quite large differences, or or at least notable differences. Again, of course, these uh, Eastern European countries, the 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 cost per capita on average is is considerably lower than in the in the in the Western European countries. And uh, then then if you look at these negative values in non-European OECD, mainly mainly this Anglo-American world, and and uh, and if the countries, so the negative values, they they refer to the fact that the, on average the the greenhouse gas emissions increased rather than decreased. So in that sense, it's not the cost for abatement, but actually it represents the the opportunity cost or in some sense benefit from the from the increase in the emissions. So now if you think about the magnitude of this, this figure, so for example, for Finland, we, we report 48. So on average, approximately 50 euros per person, uh, Finland has, has, uh, has uh, you know, the, or the, or the economic cost uh, of the greenhouse gas abatement has been approximately 50 euros per person per year. So that of course is, is uh, of course can be, uh, substantial substantial money for for individual person, especially low income uh, low income uh, households. Uh, but but overall, of course, these kind of uh, sums don't really make our economy bankrupt like like uh, like in the worst fears of the uh, in the in the nineteen nineties. So then, if you compare uh, like approximately fifty euros cost compared to the approximately. 50 euros benefit for those countries that did not follow the Kyoto Protocol and actually increase their emissions, then uh, the net effect would be something like, like 100 euros per, per person, perhaps. So notice that also, also in those countries that did not, uh, did not necessarily sign the um, Kyoto Protocol or did not ratify it, uh, the emissions didn't increase very dramatically, only, only perhaps slightly like in the case of the USA, and perhaps also the USA was not the main culprit in this kind of uh, OECD countries, that there are countries that increased uh, emissions much more and uh, had, had also bigger, uh, bigger benefits. So the average per capita costs are not really, not really that dramatic, but we should also take into account that if, if it is uh, the, this kind of, um, uh, effect continues several decades so then in this figure this is based on the on the very very new study that we that we implemented also with Sheng Dai and and Shun Shou when we look at the productivity impact of the 
of the um, carbon abatement. So in that study, we, we compare uh, TFP is so-called total factor productivity and GTFP is, is green TFP that takes into account the, the abatement of emissions. So we see that, uh, that, that there has been virtually no conventional productivity growth in terms of TFP in the, if we consider the level of the OECD countries and especially after the financial crisis in 2008, there has been has been relatively uh, we have barely managed to recover from this kind of kind of kind of shock of the of the financial crisis and the following great recession so in that sense the the productivity growth has has really stagnated like like uh, like uh, we know in in economics however if you take into account these uh, achievements in the in the abatement of the greenhouse gas emissions and and take that into account in the productivity assessment, because obviously a large, large proportion of uh, uh, economic resources, capital, labor, research and development investments have been targeted to abatement of the greenhouse gas emissions. So if we take, take the resulting reduction of the, of the greenhouse gases also into account, then the green TFP that captures that uh, has, has been growing and shows quite impressive growth, in fact. Uh, so in this paper, we argue that uh, that um, that the kind of this omitted uh, uh, greenhouse gas abatement can can uh, at least partly explain this kind of uh, uh, sluggish growth and, and stagnation of the of the productivity growth in the in the Western countries. So in the next uh, lesson then we will we will consider the theme of uh, international uh, environmental agreements. See you then. Bye-bye.